Hello and welcome back to Fourier Transform, the video course where we talk about the approximation we have with so-called Fourier series. And indeed, in today's part 13, we will show that this approximation works for square integrable functions. This means we have this nice convergence of Fourier series in the L2 space. Or you could also say, Parseval's identity holds for all L2 functions. So you see, this is an important result of the theory, and today we will finally prove it. However, before we start with that, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube, or via other means. And please don't forget, with the link in the description, you can download a lot of additional material for the videos. Okay, and then I would say, let's immediately start with the important theorem of the day. And as you already know, we consider functions that are square integrable and 2 pi periodic. And moreover, there you also know that one possibility for the inner product is given like that, where we integrate from minus pi to pi and we also divide by 2 pi. This implies that we have an orthonormal system when we consider the exponential functions like this. This is really helpful because it means that for each L2 function f, we can define the Fourier series and call it fnf. And there please recall that this inner product here gives us the Fourier coefficient and we call it ck. So this is the common definition and now the question is, what happens if we send n to infinity? And now the quick answer is, if we measure the difference between both functions with respect to the L2 norm, then we get out convergence. This means when n goes to infinity, then this norm goes to zero. So this is important, it works with respect to the L2 norm. And as you might remember from former videos is that this statement is equivalent to Parseval's identity on L2. Indeed, I would say this one is kind of important because Parseval's identity tells us that the norm squared can be calculated by using the Fourier coefficients. And if you recall the last video, then you know that we have already shown Parseval's identity for some functions in L2. Therefore, the quest of this video is to extend this to all functions in L2. And to be honest, this is not so simple, so we first have to do some preparation before we can start with the actual proof. And let's start by stating a fact which might be well known for the L2 space. It simply claims that the continuous functions are dense in the square integrable functions. And this has a similar meaning as before, it says that every L2 function can be approximated by continuous functions with respect to the L2 norm. So maybe let's make that more precise. Let's take an arbitrary L2 function f and an arbitrary small number epsilon. And then for these two inputs, we find a continuous function, which should also be 2 pi periodic. And in order to keep it simple, let's call this function g. And then what we get is that the difference measured with the L2 norm is less than epsilon. So you could say that we can get arbitrarily close to f with the continuous function g. Hence, this is exactly what it means to say that the continuous functions lie densely in L2. And in fact, the whole thing is not hard to show if you know the explicit definition of integrable functions. However, I don't want to discuss the proof here, because it's better fitting in another series like measure theory. Indeed, here I just want to use the claim to show something similar. This will be the next proposition, which talks about step functions again. Indeed, the two pi periodic step functions we have denoted with a capital S, and now I want the claim that these also lie densely in L2. Obviously, this is exactly what we need for our approximation, because we have already proven Parseval's identity for step functions. And just as a reminder, a step function looks more or less like that, 
which means we have a decomposition of our interval into finitely many intervals. And on each interval, the step function is constant. And since we talk about integrals anyway, it does not matter what the step function does on the boundary points of the intervals. The reason is just that these finitely many points will not change the integral. Okay, so we are ready for the proof of this proposition. So let's assume that we have an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero given and also an arbitrary function f which is square integrable. And in order to make everything a little bit simpler, we just say that the function is defined on the closed interval minus pi to pi. Indeed, we already know that such a function f represents a whole equivalence class in our straight L2. And now what we want to show is that every such function can be approximated by a step function. And as before, this approximation should be measured with respect to the L2 norm. Moreover, we can already use the fact from before, which tells us that we can approximate with a continuous function. So we can say we have a continuous function g defined on the interval minus pi to pi as well. And we can choose it in such a way that the distance to f is definitely less than our given epsilon. And now the advantage of this formulation is that g is defined on a compact interval which means it's also uniformly continuous. This is just a stronger formulation of continuity, which I can explain immediately. Indeed, it just makes the epsilon delta criterion of continuity work uniformly. More precisely, for any given epsilon, you find a delta which works for every point in the interval. This means we can just formulate that for every two points x and y, that are closer than delta, we can imply that the values are closer than epsilon. So you see the delta works on the x-axis where the epsilon works on the y-axis. Or to say it more precisely, it works on the values of g. And to make it more visually here, we can say that we have a delta neighborhood on the x-axis and we can shift it around as much as we want. And indeed the claim is that the corresponding values always lie in the epsilon neighborhood. So that's the whole statement of the uniform continuity and now I want to use that to define a suitable step function. And you know we have to do that with a partition of the x-axis so we have to decompose our interval from minus pi to pi. So we use finitely many intervals where each of them is smaller than delta. And since I want to have open intervals, the picture looks like this. So we have an open interval here, then comes the next one. And this continues until we reach the end on the other side again. Moreover, in order to keep it simple, let's call the intervals i1, i2, and so on. And again, the important part is that we have finitely many, so I call the last one in. And in addition, we also want that the length of each interval is definitely smaller than delta. So it really does not matter if we have different lengths. The important thing is that the length is small enough for each interval. And moreover, as you can see, the intervals should be pairwise disjoint and we want to cover the whole interval with the exception of finitely many points. Indeed, we don't have to care about these missing points because they are only finitely many and they will not change the integral at all. Okay, so now in order to define a suitable step function, we can just take the function g and this decomposition and take the upper sum. Or to say it more concretely, we will take the supremum of the function g in each interval. Hence, this results in a step function that looks like this for our example here. So formally what we do here is to define each value cj as the supremum of g. And since g is a continuous function, this supremum will always exist as a finite number. The only thing you might see that could happen is that the supremum is actually lying on the boundary point of the interval. But obviously this is also not a problem because the value is still well defined. Okay, so the picture already tells how we do it and then we get a step function we can call h of x. 
And in the case that x comes from the interval ij, the value of h is given as cj. So you see we have almost all points covered, except for finitely many, but as always we don't care about them at all. In other words, you can define them as you want, it will not matter anyway in the end. However, you should see that for the points inside a given interval, we can already write down an estimate. So the question is, what is the maximal difference between g and h at a given point x? And here we can just fix the interval ij, so let's say x comes from ij. And now if you look at the picture, you see that h of x is also given by g for another point in the interval. Hence, instead of h of x, we could just write g of y for a specific y in the interval. However, as already mentioned, it could happen that the supremum lies on the boundary, so we have to include that as well. So this is easy, just say instead of the open interval, we take the closed interval here. Indeed, we could also do this in the definition of the supremum, which will not change anything, but then you see that the supremum is actually a maximum. However, in the end, the important thing is that the difference we get is smaller than epsilon. And you know we have this because the length of the given interval is definitely less than delta. So there the uniform continuity of g helps us to get this estimate for almost every point x in the whole interval. And now we can use that to check how close the step function is to our function f. So we calculate the difference f with h with respect to the L2 norm. And since it's a well-defined norm, we know it satisfies the triangle inequality. Which simply means we can put g in the middle. So we have two parts in the L2 norm here and we already know both of them are small. Indeed g was already chosen in such a way that it is close to the function f. And on the other hand h was chosen that it is close to g. In fact we can immediately see that this also holds with respect to the L2 norm because this one is given as the square root of the integral. And you know inside the integral we have the difference between g and h squared. And now we know from before that this difference is actually less than epsilon except for finitely many points and these ones we can ignore in the integral. Hence what we get is that the whole thing here is less than the square root of 2 pi times epsilon. So in summary we see that the difference f minus h with respect to the L2 norm is less than a constant times epsilon. And since the whole thing here works for every epsilon, what we get is that h can be as close as we want to f. And this is exactly what we mean when we say that the step functions are dense in L2. Okay, and now we can use this result to finally prove the theorem we have stated at the beginning. And the short formulation for this is simply that for every L2 function, the Fourier series converges to f with respect to the L2 norm. And as you know, we have already proven that for step functions, which means with our approximation, we can extend the proof for every L2 function. And not so surprisingly, the assumptions in the proof are exactly the same, so we take an arbitrary epsilon and an L2 function f. And now by the proposition above, we know that we can choose a step function h, which is closer than epsilon. Indeed, this is all we need, and now we have to do the correct estimates. And as you know, the only thing we can do is to use the triangle inequality. This means, artificially, we can put the function h into the norm as well. And moreover, we can also bring in the Fourier series of this step function. This is helpful because we already know that the Fourier series converges to h. Hence, we should rearrange the parts inside the norm a little bit. First, I want to have f minus h minus the corresponding Fourier series. However, there by definition we know that this curved fn is linear, so we can pull in our minus h. 
And then you see what remains is just plus h and minus fnh. And there we have the two parts where I want to apply the triangle inequality. This means we have an inequality here and the plus sign comes out of the norm. And now you should immediately see that the second part here is very nice because it goes to zero when n goes to infinity. Therefore, we just have to check what we can do with the first part. Indeed, this combination we have already seen before. It's just the difference of two vectors which are orthogonal to each other. Hence, exactly the generalized Pythagorean theorem can help us there. And there we have to talk about the squares of the norms. So first we have this vector. And then if we add the other part squared, then we get the length of the full vector squared out. So you know this fact that immediately comes out of the orthogonality we have for the Fourier series. So you see, you should never forget that the Fourier series is just an orthogonal projection inside our L2 space. Which simply implies that the other part here, the difference, is simply the normal component and the generalized Pythagorean theorem holds. And most importantly, it means if we completely omit this part here, we have an inequality between this norm and the norm of f minus h. And with that we get something very nice, because the first part here is simply less or equal than the norm of f minus h, which is less than epsilon by assumption. And since we already know that the second part here goes to zero when n goes to infinity, we can conclude that the whole thing in the limit cannot be bigger than epsilon. However, since epsilon was chosen arbitrarily at the beginning anyway, the only conclusion is that this limit has to be zero. In other words, this is just the classical sandwich theorem for sequences of real numbers. And that's it. Now we have proven that the Fourier series converges for every L2 function with respect to the L2 norm. And again, I should emphasize this is not a pointwise convergence of the Fourier series, but just a convergence with respect to the integral. And with that, our long discussion about Parseval's identity in L2 is finally done. Hence, with the next videos, we can talk about some other stuff concerning Fourier series. So I really hope I meet you there again, and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you.